Several years ago, when I was living in Jackson, Tennessee, we had Brother Jack Evans and the course from Southwestern Christian College to come and present a program, and in the middle of that program, Brother Evans spoke about the importance of God's Word and the study of it. And he told about three college professors that decided to take a boat ride, and they would take a young man to carry them out, and if he didn't know much, they'd make fun of him. So they selected a young man and started out, and one of them asked him if he knew anything about biology, and he said he didn't, so they had a big laugh about that, and said, one-fourth of your life is gone. So they went a little further, and the other one asked him if he knew anything about sociology, and he said he didn't, so they laughed again and said, half your life's gone. One little further, and the other one asked him if he knew anything about psychology, and he didn't know anything about that either, so they laughed real big and said, three-fourths of your life gone. About that time, they hit a big rock, and the boat began to sink. He began to pull off his clothes, and they said, what are you doing? He said, you know anything about swimology? And they, and they said, no. He said, well, all of your life's gone. <laughs> Brother Evans' point was we can know a lot about a lot of things, but if we don't know something about the Word of God, we lose our life here and our life in eternity. I appreciate very much the invitation that has been presented to me to have a part in this program. I certainly appreciate Brother Winkler and the work that he's done and the elders and everybody's had a part in planning this program and this lectureship. It's been my privilege to have a part in two of them and to attend three of the four that's been conducted. And I tell people wherever I go, and I really believe that, that this is one of the finest lectureships been conducted today. And certainly I profited by it, and I know that you have too. I've enjoyed the many lessons that have been presented thus far, and trust that each of us may have been edified and built up and strengthened in the study of the Word of God. This morning it's my responsibility to discuss clarifying the alleged contradictions in the Bible. Atheists and infidels have attempted ever since the Bible was written to disprove its history, to impugn its motives, and to dis misrepresent its morals. Skeptics and unbelievers argue like this. They say the Bible is full of mistakes and obvious myths and self-contradictions. This proves that it couldn't have come from God, but it had to come from man. Certainly they say the Bible is to be considered an ancient book filled with wise sayings and many valuable illustrations of certain moral principles, but it's not to be elevated to the level of a divine production. Now, it's not to be denied that certain passages in the Bible, when compared with corresponding passages at first sight, appear contradictory. But, my friends, the fact that two statements are difficult to reconcile does not prove they contradict each other. It will be my purpose in this study's time for me is to talk about or to explain the meaning of some of the terms and some of the rules we need to understand, then to talk about some things that are true if contradictions actually exist, to talk about the fact that uh, the, some of the contradictions that may be there and some things that would be true if they are, to look at the source of contradictions, and then to talk about some of the alleged contradictions in the Bible. First, let's consider the meaning of some terms and some rules we need to keep in mind when we talk about contradictions. By clarifying, we mean to make clear or to remove misunderstanding. By the term contradiction, we mean a statement or proposition that contradicts or denies another statement or itself, and it's impossible for it to be true, that is, for both of them. The term contradicting in logic means a statement that is so related to a second statement that it's impossible for both of the statements to be true. By discrepancy, we mean the state or quality of something being discordant and inconsistent. By difficult, we mean something that's hard to do, hard to deal with, hard to understand. And by the term alleged, we simply mean something is asserted to be true or to exist. And one of the ramifications of the law of contradiction is that nothing can have at the same time and at the same place contradictory and inconsistent qualities. For example, a door may be shut or open, but the same door cannot be shut and open at the same time. Shut and open are different, but they're not contradictory unless they're firm to the same thing at the same time. The principle is this. Differences are not necessarily contradictory. 
The law of contradiction also implies that a proposition cannot, with reference to the same thing, be both true and false. For example, to say that Jane Smith is a wife and to say that Jane Smith is not a wife is a contradiction. But to say that Jane Smith is a wife and then to say that Jane Smith is a mother is not a contradiction. But rather, the two terms, even though they're different, supplement or complement each other. In other words, it's possible sometimes by close study without forcing the issue to show that two supposedly contradictory passages really complement each other. It must be impossible to harmonize two statements before we conclude that they're contradictory. The first principle of historical science is that any solution that offers or affords a possible method of harmonizing two passages is to be preferred to the assumption of error or inaccuracy, even though the statements may be made by the same writer or by two different writers. Now, to act on any other basis is to assume error, not prove it. As we think about statements that, uh, regarding this, we must keep this thought in mind, that two statements are not necessarily contradictory unless it's impossible for both to be true. For example, if on any rational hypothesis they both can be supposed true, they both may be true without contradicting one another. Now, this rule is made necessary by the fact that oftentimes writers and speakers will omit details, and the absence of those details seem to make their statements inconsistent with one another while the presence of those details would remove all inconsistencies and make them perfectly clear. Now, it's unjust and unfair to refuse any writer the benefit of this rule, because in so doing we may accuse of falsehood the most truthful writers and of inaccuracy those who are the best informed on their subject. The absence of a solution to a seeming contradiction does not prove or give evidence that there is no solution. It's quite possible that some of us may have difficulty answering or solving the seeming solutions brought forth by the infidel, while others who have delved more deeply into the study of the Scriptures have little problem solving those difficulties. But what are some things that are true if contradictions actually exist in the Bible? To charge that there are contradictions in the Bible, that is, actual contradictions in the Bible, implies other propositions that are devilish in their nature. What are some of them? In the first place, if actual contradictions in, exist in the Bible, it implies or leaves the impression that God is a liar. In 1 Samuel 15, 49, the Bible says that the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent. Paul, in his letter to Titus, said, In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began, Titus 1, 2. The Hebrew writer said in Hebrews 6, 17, that the two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Now, if it be true that God cannot lie, and if God is the author of the Bible, then it follows that no two statements in the Bible can contradict each other. In the second place, if actual contradictions exist in the Bible, then God has not revealed himself to man. If the Bible is written by fallible men, unaided by any higher power, contradicting each other often, and if it be true that God cannot lie, then God has not revealed himself to man. If actual contradictions and falsehoods exist in the Bible, then it proves, as we've already shown, that God is not its author. And if God is not its author, then God has not revealed himself to man in the Bible. In the third place, if actual contradictions exist in the Word of God, it proves that the Bible's claim to be inspired is false. I believe one of the best uh, statements in the Bible regarding the inspiration of the Bible is 1 Corinthians 2, beginning with verse 6. 
Paul said, How be we speak wisdom among them the perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world which come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world and our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But that is, as it is written, I have not seen or ear heard, neither have in the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of man, save the Spirit of man that is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things, as some translations have with spiritual words. Now, my friends, this is a claim for the inspiration of the Bible, for the verbal inspiration of the Bible. That is, that to, just as the spirit that's in the only one that knows what's in a man's, the spirit that's in the man, unless he tells somebody else. So the only one that knew the mind of God was the Spirit of God. Since the apostles received the Spirit of God, then the apostles knew the mind of God. And not only did God reveal the thoughts unto the apostles, but helped choose out of their vocabulary the very words with which to express those thoughts. Not only does the Bible claim to be verbally inspired, but it claims to be able to furnish us completely and perfectly unto all good works. All scriptures given the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. It claims to be the truth. Jesus said, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. John 17, 17. But if actual contradictions and falsehoods exist in the Bible, then, my friends, the Bible is not inspired. At least these things are not inspired. And if we can prove anything false in the Bible and contradictions actually exist, then how can we know what we can believe and what we cannot believe? It seems to me that if we ever prove that anything's false in the Bible, then we just as well leave the rest of it alone, because how do we know we can believe it? If actual contradictions exist in the Bible, it proves that truth is not as powerful as contradictions and lies. There's no book that's affected the lives of men in all areas more than the Bible. How many books would be left in most libraries if all the books that had been influenced directly or indirectly of the Bible were removed? How many works of art, songs, laws, etc., would be taken out of this world, and how much poorer would the world be if all of them were removed that were influenced by the Bible? If the Bible, evidence cannot be believed, and if that which the Bible writers presented is nothing more than cunningly devised fables, it follows that a group of unlettered peasants in Galilee devised a system of moral philosophy and religion that has done more to help mankind than all the enlightened teachers this world's ever known. Imposture was never crowned with such a victory in open conflict with the truth and in the Bible if actual contradictions exist. But now what are some of the designs of contradictions in the Bible? Richard Watley once wrote that the seeming contradictions of the Bible are too numerous not to be the result of design and doubtless were designed. Not as difficult as to test our faith, but is furnishing one of the best methods of instruction that could have been devised by mutually modifying, explaining, limiting, or extending one another's meaning. But what are some of them? One of them is it gives strong dental proof that there was no collusion among the sacred writers. The seeming contradictions in the Bible become one of the greatest proofs that the Bible writers did not get together and conceive a plan by which to deceive the world. David Hartley wrote in 1749 that no single forger or combination of forgers 
would have permitted the seeming contradictions that exist in a few places. They're so obvious at first sight not to have been prevented had there been any fraud intended. Not only that, but they become stimulants to the human intellect. Difficulties have always aroused men to put forth greater effort to find the solution to those difficulties. Bible difficulties have stimulated infidels to write more books criticizing the Bible than any other book. And it's also stimulated believers to put forth greater effort in order to answer the criticisms of the infidels and the critics. They become a stimulant. Westcott wrote that the very existence of the difficulties in the Gospels, which are the groundwork of our faith, is a fresh incentive to vigorous and rational study. Not all that, but they show that God, the Word of God and nature came from the same source. God has revealed himself in his word and in his works. In both, we see a self-revealing, self-concealing God who reveals himself only to those who put forth diligent effort. In both, we see stimulants to faith and reasons for doubt. In both, we see contradictions whose higher harmony is hidden except to those who give their whole mind and heart in reverence to God. In both, in a word, it's the law of revelation that the heart of man should be tested in receiving the word of God. And then in both the spiritual and the physical realm. As someone has said, man should earn his bread by the sweat of his brow. And not only that, but they also test the moral character of individuals. You know, Jesus often spoke in parables to test the sincerity and the character of his followers. In Matthew 13, when Jesus began to speak in parables, the disciples came to him and said, Lord, why do you speak to them in parables? He said, Because unto you it is given to know the kingdom of heaven, the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For every, unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But unto him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. Therefore speak out of them in parables, because seeing they see, and hearing they hear, and understand not. In other words, Jesus knew that those who were honest and sincere of character would put forth the necessary effort to learn the truths he was presenting. But those shallow, superficial characters would not do so. So it is today. Those who love the truth are going to put forth the necessary effort to learn what the truth is. But those who love not the truth will be sent a strong delusion, 2 Thessalonians 2, 10 through 12, and will feel completely justified because of the difficulties and the seeming contradictions in rejecting the Word of God. But what are some of the sources of the seeming contradictions of the Bible? If we can learn some of the sources and see why the seeming contradictions are brought about, then in many cases, we will have removed the, many of the seeming contradictions. Haley, the book that's probably a standard work in this field, lists about ten or more different uh, sources of alleged contradictions. But it seems to me that they might be listed under about five or six heads. One source of seeming contradictions is ignorance. The critics of the Bible have long contended that the Bible is filled with errors and contradictions, but when asked to produce one, they are in most cases not only ignorant of the, of the errors of the Bible, but of the precious truths of the Bible itself. For example, the critics have long contended that the many references in the Old Testament to the Hittites, about 40 in number, is an error, that there was no such nation. Yet in 1906, in an excavation site about 90 miles east of Ankaria, Turkey, they found the capital of the Hittite nation. Another thing that is a source of contradictions is failing to recognize that no Bible writer claimed to tell the whole story. For example, each of the Bible writers had a definite purpose in mind and that which he presented. 
Naturally, he would select the material, the ideas that the Holy Spirit revealed it unto him and would reveal that. That would accomplish the purpose that he had in mind without any writer claiming to tell the whole story. The gospel writers, they presented different views and naturally would select different materials to present the view they had in mind. And they might differ, but they wouldn't contradict each other. In other words, we have to read all the accounts to get the whole story. And then another source of contradiction is failing to be fair with the Bible. Sometimes people are not as fair with the Bible as they are with the other books. That is, failure to actually read what the text says. You see, for years, the many critics have uh, felt that they're, they, in regard to the reading the Bible, that they have found a contradiction in the account of the, beginning of the origin of the human race. They argue that the Bible says that everybody descended from Adam and Eve. Then they say, but the Bible teaches that Cain went into the land of Nod and found a woman who became his wife. So there's a contradiction. They argue that if everybody descended from Adam and Eve, then where did this woman come from that Cain found? Well, my friends, if people had actually read what the text says, no such ridiculous criticism would have ever been brought forward. The text actually says in Genesis 4, 16 and 17 that Cain dwelt in the land of Nod and that he knew his wife and she conceived and bare Enoch. The Bible does not say that Cain went into the land of Nod alone and there he found a woman already living there who became his wife. It follows, logically, if you look at what is said, that Cain went into the land of Nod with his wife, who obviously was one of the daughters of Adam and Eve, mentioned in Genesis 5 and verse 4, and dwelt in the land of Nod with his wife. And while there, he knew his wife, she conceived, and bare a son. That's what the text actually says. Then another source is... Misinterpretation of the Bible. For example, the critics have long contended that James and Paul contradict each other. They contend that Paul teaches that one is saved by faith without works, Romans 4, and James teaches that one is saved by works, and thus sometimes might even go so far as to say without faith. I don't think anybody would do that, but they make them contradict each other. But you know, this is brought about by failing to read actually what both of them teach. They both teach that one is saved by faith when that faith leads an individual to carry out or to practice the works of obedience or the acts of obedience which God has designed. In James 2.24, James says, you see the habit works a man is justified and not by faith only. And no Bible writer teaches that one is saved by faith only. Paul, on the other hand, teaches in Galatians 5, 6, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Now, where's the contradiction? There is no contradiction. But to both harmonize, in the statements were made, in fact, faith that works by love harmonizes what Paul and James said. But then another source of contradiction is a failure to recognize a change in circumstances. For example, the critics think that they have found a contradiction in between Genesis 1.31 and Genesis 6 and verse 6. Genesis 1.31 says that God beheld everything that he had made, and behold, it was good. And Genesis 6 and verse 6 says... It repented the Lord that he had made man, and it grieved him in his heart. Well, they say, now here it says everything God made was good, and yet here it says God was grieved at some of the things he made, particularly man. But my friends, the critics fail to take into consideration the fact that those statements were made nearly 1,000 years apart. Genesis 1.31 was the statement was made after God had created everything and before sin entered the world. Genesis 6 and verse 6 was stated or written after man had degenerated to such a spiritual level 
that every imagination of the fault of his heart was only evil continually. Both statements were absolutely correct at the time they were made. But many times the critics will fail to take consideration the change in circumstances or the length of time between one one statement is made and another statement is made. Place random statements side by side and say, look, they contradict each other. So we see some of the sources that are brought about. But one, it seems to me, that might be one of the leading sources is the blind prejudice of the critics. Some people do not want to be convinced that the Bible is the Word of God. And it matters not how much evidence you may present to prove that it is the Word of God, they will not believe. You see, many of the criticisms that have been brought by the critics have proven to be unfounded and no basis for them. But does that bother the critic? Not at all, if he's blindly refusing to accept the evidence. Does this not indicate a state of mind that says in so many words, I will not believe the Bible is the Word of God until you answer every objection to my satisfaction? And I'll determine what my satisfaction is. That is one chief source of alleged contradictions. But now what are some of the alleged contradictions that are found in the New Testament? Well, one of them would be the difference in the Synoptic Gospels. Now these differences in the Synoptic Gospels are the result of a failure on the part of the evangelists to give us a faithful record or they're the result of definite design on the part of the Holy Spirit. Now, it seems quite clear that the differences of the Synoptic Gospels are not the result of forgetfulness or carelessness on the part of the Gospel writers for two reasons. First, all the, contra all the differences put together do not constitute a single contradiction. And secondly, when the differences are carefully studied, you'll find the add beauty to the gospel accounts. For example, each of the gospel writers had a definite purpose in mind in his presentation of Jesus Christ. Matthew presents him as king of the Jews, Mark the servant of Jehovah, Luke the perfect son of man, and John the son of God. Naturally, each of the writers would select words and deeds of Jesus which, though absolutely correct, might differ completely in many respects from the other gospel writers. But remember, one of the rules is that differences do not constitute contradictions unless it's impossible for both to be true. Not all that, but a legitimate contradiction can never be charged as long as there's a possible way of harmonizing the two statements that seem to contradict each other. So these are just some rules that one might use in thinking about the differences in the gospel accounts. Another alleged contradiction is the account regarding the healing of the blind men at Jericho. You recall that uh, Luke and Mark, as Jesus was traveling toward Jerusalem to observe the Passover, indicate that one blind man was healed. Mark 10, 46, and Luke 18, 35, while Matthew mentions two blind men, Matthew 10 and verse 30. And also Luke and Mark, or Matthew and Mark indicate, or seem to leave the impression, the healing was done as he was leaving Jericho, while Luke's account indicates that the healing was done as he drew nigh to Jericho. Now in regard to the first part of that, if Mark had said and Luke had said that only one blind man was healed, and Matthew had said, more than one blind man was healed. Then there would be a contradiction, but they didn't make any such statement. In regard to the second part of it, there are three possible solutions. And remember, to be fair with any writer speaker, as long as there's a possible solution or way of harmonizing two statements, a legitimate contradiction cannot be charged. One is that there may have been three blind men healed near Jericho. 
That is, the incident mentioned by Luke may have been different than the one mentioned by Matthew and Mark. I do not believe that it is, but what I'm saying is there's a possibility that may be true. That cannot be ruled out. The second is, Edward Robinson indicates or says that the word drew nigh can also carry with it the meaning of nearby or in the vicinity of. And that both accounts took place, or the healing took place, near or in the vicinity of Jericho. And Luke was merely used it in that way when he made the statement, drew nigh to Jericho. That cannot be ruled out. Another solution, and the one that's most often given, is that there were two Jerichos at the time of, of Christ. There was the old Jericho of the Old Testament, 1 Kings 16.34, which lay mostly in ruins at the time of Christ. And about two miles to the southwest, there was the new Jericho, which had been built by Herod. Thus Matthew and Mark's record, they were talking about the healing of the blind men as Jesus left Jericho, that is the old Jericho, and Luke's record was referring to his drawing nigh to the new Jericho. The healing took place between the two Jerichos. As long as there's a possible solution to seeming contradictions, a contradiction cannot be charged. Another one is, is, would be the words written on the cross. Matthew says, this is Jesus, King of the Jews. Mark just says, King of the Jews. Luke says, this is the King of the Jews. And John says, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. And then adds the superscription that it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. The sum total is, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Now, my friends, where's the contradiction? These verses do not contradict each other. They supplement each other and give the sum total of what was written on the cross. Then another contradiction that's charged, and that is regarding the time when the women arrived at the tomb. For example, Matthew talks about at the dawning of the day, Matthew 28, 1. Mark says very early in the morning at the rising of the sun, Mark 16, 1. Luke says very early in the morning, Luke 24, 1, 1 and 2. And John says while it was yet dark. And so the critics charge that this contradicts at the time is when they arose. Well, I think it can be safely said that Luke's, that Mark's statement very early in the morning supported by all the others that he did not intend to contradict himself when he said the rising of the sun. Tuesday morning when I left the airport at Spartanburg Greenville, it was about 7.30 our time, about 6.30 here. The sun was beginning to rise, yet you couldn't see the sun. But he was rising. But my friends, it was still a little dark. Now, I recognize that today, and you do too. Why do we have such a problem recognizing that nature has always acted the same way, even the time of Christ, like it does today? I frankly have no problem very early in the morning, while it was yet dark at the rising of the sun, harmonizing the statements when I see the same thing today. I grew up on the farm, and that was quite a common occurrence. That as the sun was rising, you'd see the sun. You didn't actually see the sun. The sun was rising, and yet it was still a little dark. And I believe the world's always acted the same way and still acts the same way today. Brother McGarvey says the word came can sometimes mean or is used in the sense of starting. That is a starting point. He gives Matthew 14, 7 and John 6, 17 as examples of that. And thus Mark's account was referring to the fact when they, uh, talking about when they left or started for the tomb, or Matthew and John, and then Mark is talking about when they arrived. All of these are possible solutions to the statement that's found here. But now what about the names of the women? Another contradiction is charged regarding the names mentioned by the Bible writers. For example, Matthew mentions Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph. Mark mentions Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome. Luke mentions Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, Joanna and the other women, while John just mentions Mary Magdalene. 
Now, my friends, if any one of the Bible writers had said the only ones that came to the tomb are the ones I mentioned, then there'd be a contradiction. But they didn't use any such exclusive term. The only fair way is that all the women came to the tomb. And for some reason we may or may not know, each writer chose to mention the ones that did and did not choose to mention the others. Then another contradiction that's often charged, and that is the number of angels that were seen with the women at the tomb. Luke or Matthew mentions the one that rolled back the stone and spake to the women. Luke mentions the two women stood by them in white apparel. And John mentions the fact that Mary Magdalene saw two angels. Now, we do not know why they used the terms as they did, but Matthew chose to mention the angel that did the speaking without mentioning the other. On the other hand, John and Luke chose to mention the fact there were two angels, but they said nothing about who did the speaking. It's not uncommon for us to meet a friend, have a conversation with that friend, without referring to or even mentioning another friend that was present at the time. While later on we may be talking about the same incident and mention both friends. Have we contradicted ourselves? No, we just simply omitted some of the details the first time around, and the absence of those details made a seeming contradiction. Now, we recognize that in dealing with one another today. Why can't we allow that in regard to the Bible writers? Another contradiction we, or question we might ask is, do Acts 9-7 and Acts 22-9 contradict each other? This has to do with the converse of Saul of Tarsus, and Acts 9 and verse 7 mentions the fact that the man who journeyed with him heard, uh, stood speeches, hearing a voice but seeing no man. But Acts 22, 9 indicates they didn't hear a voice. Well, this contradiction is charged because of a failure to recognize that words sometimes have different meanings. For example, the word here is obviously used at least two ways in the Bible. It's sometimes used in the sense of hearing a sound, but not understanding what is being said. It's sometimes used in the sense of perception or understanding. For example, in John 8, 43, Jesus said to some Jews standing right there in front of him, Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my words. Well, obviously the Lord didn't mean they weren't hearing what he was saying. They heard the words when they're standing right in front of him. Yet he said they didn't hear what he said. But the first part of it really explains it. You don't understand what I'm saying. He uses it the same way in Matthew 13 in verse 15. This people's heart is waxed gross, their ears are dull of hearing, their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears. If you go back a little earlier, you'll find that he was talking about their failing to understand. Do 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 8 and Numbers 25, 9 contradict each other? Paul mentions 3 and 20,000 fell in one day in connection with the plague, while Numbers 25 mentions 24,000. Well, there's three possible solutions. Will we refuse to allow Bible writers to speak in terms or use round figures? We do it all the time. Secondly, a reading of Matthew tw or Numbers 25, 4 and 5 indicates that the, the leaders were to kill those who led the people, which Adam Clark thinks may have been as much as a thousand. Paul doesn't mention those. Furthermore, Paul says, there fell in one day three and twenty thousand. We don't know how long the plague lasted. It may have lasted one day, it may have lasted a week. There's no contradiction, really, between the two statements. So, my friends, when we recognize and put forth the effort to study what the Bible teaches, the seeming contradictions disappear. Now, that's not to say that all difficulties will be answered this side of eternity. They may or may not be. But the absence of a solution to a problem does not mean there is no solution. And if you are the fact of all the criticisms that have been raised through the years of the critics, proven to be unfounded, it seems to me that all of us ought to be careful in criticizing the Word of God. I thank you.